Hi, I'm James Barron, and it's my pleasure today to have Alexis Rockman and Amy Capalazzo. We're here to celebrate Alexis's show at James Barron Art called A Molecule from Madness. A quick introduction, Amy Capalazzo, basically everything she's touched has turned to gold. Her most recent venture is Art Intelligence Global. Um, She's kind of ripped through the art world with kind of almost like a meteor with um, Christie's Sotheby's um, art agency partners. Um, one of the really scintillating minds in the art world and she's been called an art disruptor on the back of a chair at the American, American Academy in Art. I think actually both our guests today are art disruptors. Alexis Rockman, who uh, has several shows going on right now, excuse me. Uh, the Bruce Museum next May in 2023, which is organized by the American Federation of the Arts. Oceanus opening up on May 23rd at the Mystic Seaport and the Ackland, North Carolina Shipwrecks, uh, a show opening in September. So a welcome and Alexis, basically we were thinking we would talk about water in your work, which is an element from the start. That's true. Um, next image, please. Amy, you're on. I'm on. Look at this snapping turtle. Well, I was going to make some quippy statement that like, don't all children who grew up on the Upper East Side of Manhattan become captivated with water? <laughs> yes, <laughs> <Not really>. exactly. <laughs> uh, well, this is from a period of your work, Alexis, that I know very well firsthand is when you were sort of getting your sea legs, uh, no pun intended, in your career, and you were focusing on I guess a couple of different loves. One was all that is in the natural world, all that, all that, all that is, and all that is in danger of not existing anymore in the natural world, as well as an incredible love for paint and moving it around and making it seductive and beautiful, and um, being kind of fearless about being both beautiful and slightly ominous in <laughs> what you're depicting. So uh, this is a really classically great example. I like the ghost of the snapping turtle above the water, which is sort of, or sort of like a moot. This reminds me a little bit of a cartoon, funny enough, right? It's got like a roadrunner effect where you, you see the shadow of where the snapping turtle was and then it's moving out. But in that you've made this whole palimpsest of where the snapping turtle. That's beautiful to say. And one, one thing I did want to bring up is that, you know, I was 23 when I made this and, uh, there was this crisis of, I want to make paintings that have a, a relationship to art history and figuration, but I also want it to be taken seriously as a painting. And how do I get those things to work together? And color field painting was a sort of way in. Mm -hmm. I think it's, that's, you've just pointed out, you've just hit upon one of the most important dualities of your work. And that is how to me, first and foremost, you're a painter. Like if you weren't allowed to paint these images because they were forbidden or verboten in some way, you would paint something else. Like you would never not paint. But you're able to take your love of painting and your facility in the language of painting and marry it to uh, a deep knowledge, scholarship, passion, urgency about the natural world. And that is pretty incredible. So. I, think I, I, I always think I was lucky to be uh, to be married, to be born when I was, because if I'd been born 10 years earlier, there's no way I would have been allowed to show the work I wanted to make. Oh, no, it would have been the dour 70s, like painting would have been declared dead, figuration, dead, dead, dead. You wouldn't really have been allowed to have passion for these subjects and depict them in any realistic form. I mean, it, it would have been, you would, you would have been relegated to like, uh, yeah, uh, uh, like a academic textbook illustrator probably would have been your fate. Uh, right. And there were worse fates than that. Yeah. Thank God you've been liberated. But I feel like um, you playing with that boundary. I mean, I think a lot of people who are not as familiar with the history of art would look at your work and see amazing, you know, again, like, elegant, but also a little bit sinister, a little bit ominous depictions of nature and, and its fate in our, in our very uh, modern, modern time, and in, in, in some cases, the destruction of nature. But for those of us looking at painting a lot, we see all of the things you're doing and all of the painterly affects that you're, 
you know, your sort of flaunting or your kind of, um, with a kind of bravado showing how competent you are as a painter itself. So I always enjoy that about your work is that there's, there's a painting underneath all of that messaging and on, underneath all of that imagery and figuration. And, and there's even like scholarship and science that leaves me, you know, gobsmacked and wide-eyed and slack-jawed that I'm <laughs> terrible and crazy yeah. natural robots, but um, that is true for sure. Let's, so, let's move on a little bit with some images if we, yep. And um, I think just- again. Alexis, can you talk a little bit about um, the relationship of your oil paintings to your watercolors? Because it sometimes seems to me that the oil paintings look like watercolors and sometimes even vice versa a bit. Um, well, I mean, I think that, as I mentioned, the color field strategy, I was looking at a lot of Morris Lewis and people like that as a way to sort of get representation going and early surrealism, Rothko and stuff like that. And, um, you know, that that lends itself very well to watercolor as well. So there's a, a back and forth. And as I was telling Amy yesterday, um, my wife, Dorothy Spears, when we first met, said, I love your watercolors. I wish your paintings were more like your watercolors. And that was <laughs> 23 years ago or so. And um, I've, I always listen to the women in my life, especially the <laughs> Next image. Very, very smart. Um, this is included because it's in the show. And this is a painting from 1990. And you can say that the amaryllis is grabbing water from the back of that unfortunate squirrel. Next image. Trip to the Amazon with my friend Mark Dion, and um, I did a cycle of work about uh, Guyanese ecology, which is in the northern part of South America. Next image. Again, celebrating the more darker, or just some would say disgusting, I would say fascinating and enchanting, um, things that live in degraded ecologies. This is a project that, again, I did with Mark Dion off and on over the last 30 years, Concrete Jungle, which examines animals and plants that are able to use humans as a resource, things that live in the gutter, in the sewer, and ditches, and so on and so forth. Next image. You have a way of making them very beautiful, by the way. I mean, they're like, it's, you know, to think of like a Coke can floating, I mean, the whole thing is sort of Ew, yucky, gross, pond scum, and litter on top. But you have a way of making them interesting and seductive all the same. Thank you. Um, this was truly the most revolting place I've ever been on a beach outside of Georgetown, Guyana, where I thought the one thing that would love this place is a fly. So I constructed this very big painting through the eyes of a fly. And what would it be? It would be so excited to see all this garbage and dead whales and dead sea turtles and so on and so forth. Um, Tigris and Euphrates River, which is an, under incredible stress in the Middle East. Now it does not look like this anymore. Next image. But look at that sky. Oh my, this is a very classic example. This is what uh, Dorothy was talking about. Look at your yes. magnificent movement of paint, like this watercolor. This is watercolor and acrylic, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, that's what we were talking about earlier. So I've, I've gone back to letting the, letting the alchemy of the image um, be uh, part of the, certainly my enchantment. Uh, next image. And their water can be very threatening as well. This is Alfred Russell Wallace's um, expedition back from Brazil in, I believe, uh, 1858, and his ship sank and he lost all his research. He's a Victor very exciting and important Victorian naturalist. Um, next image one of the more famous shipwrecks from the point of view of our cat, Millicent, um, <laughs> and, a, a, and an unfortunate rat who happened to stow away as well. Next image. And again, as Amy said so brilliantly earlier, I'm having a, hopefully a conversation with who I consider to be my heroes. In this case, it's Homer and that fantastic show that just closed at the Met had some of some watercolors that have profoundly influenced me through reproduction over the decades. And it was such an incredible thrill to see them in person. Next image. And again, this is a painting that's actually right next to me in my studio where it's really, you know, 95% like a watercolor except for the ship and that horse's uh, head. Um, well, you explain you explained this to me yesterday, and I think the, our you know our listeners need to our viewers, I guess, need to know what that horse is because it was so it was so alarming to me. And so, of course, it looks like a little bit of a beautiful horse, and you title it the Calms of Capricorn. So I think it's some, somehow related to 
astrological zodiac signs in their imagery, but explain a little bit what the horse is doing. Sure. Well, the comms of Capricorn are a part of the ocean where there's very little wind. And what happens if you're dependent on the wind and you're on the ocean in a sailboat, um, and by the way, I'm not a sailor and I know very little about sailing empirically, but I know a little bit about the history of sailing after doing the Shipwrecks Project, which is actually at the Ackland Museum now until September, and then it opens at the Princeton University Art Museum in September, um, is that when you have something called horse latitudes, which means there is no wind, um, there's a tradition of throwing the horse overboard, which when Andrea Grover asked me if I would make a painting that dealt with that um, when I started the Shipwrecks Project a couple of years ago, I was so appalled by it that I and, and heartbroken that I could not not do that image or try to come up with something that could express that. The horse just, obviously doesn't make it. Which is so sad, which is so, but it would make sense. You bail anything that weighs a lot and is weighing down the ship or you consumes fuel or you- And drinking water. Mm -hmm. Drinking water, wow, it really gets dire, right? Yep. Um, I would wonder why they wouldn't eat the horse though, but I, what, you know, what do I know? Well, you have to kill it on board. That's its own sort of <laughs> big master. So I don't know. That sounds like a don't get me going. <laughs> uh, it's like it's like the the daughter party on a ship, right? Like, exactly. <laughs> keep yeah. it going. I, I wanted to ask you because this when I saw it in your studio, I was really impressed with the background because it's oil and cold wax on wood. Yeah. What I noticed about that is that it's very hard to use oil and see the wax is going to dry and shrink. And you have no cracking on this painting. And that is about your own personal capacity for alchemy, where you really understand how the materials are going to behave. And it's shocking to me that there's no sort of foible in, in the way you apply the material and then how it dries and cures and ages over time. I, I mean, that's a testimony to your skill as a, as a painter, but just there's actually very few painters that understand their materials, I think, <laughs> as well as you. Well, thank you. That's that's a lot of trial and error, and um, I've had some debacles that I won't mention. But um, I, I one one hopes that uh, it'll hold up. It seems so far so good. Um, I've been doing that for a couple of decades. Cold wax is not heated up like um, encaustic, like Jasper Johns or Flag or something like that. This is a, has petroleum in it, and the key is getting it to actually dry. That's the hard part. So sometimes I drag them out into the sun for a couple of hours to cure them. Um, but thank you. I, I think it's pretty, I've never seen anything quite like it. Mm -hmm. That's great. Next image. All right, now we're getting real. Um, I just want to mention that I learned about the climate crisis, global warming, whatever you want to call it, in 1995 when I was um, traveling, doing a sort of lecture with a paleontologist named Peter Ward. And I asked him what he was afraid of. And he described this so-called condition. And I was terrified instantly because I thought that humans would never solve this because it's invisible and a long-term project. Little did I know that um, you know, 27 years later, it would actually be like in a daily crisis for, you know, big chunk of the planet. So I always thought that was like a perfect thing to paint because it had elements of science fiction. It had the history of the apocalypse, apocalyptic iconography, and ideas about ruins and stuff like that. So um, I instantly, well, not instantly, I sort of started to integrate it into my, my work. So um, ne next image. This is the first one that is overtly about um, climate change. And there was a theory at one point through Cal, uh, Caltech that um, changing of the, um, the ocean currents would actually lead to a snowball earth, which would actually cool North America. And that was one scenario. And the other scenario was that it would heat it. And now it's obvious that it's the heating issue. So um, uh, I don't know which is worse, but um, I always thought Central Park growing up in Manhattan was a perfect place to start. Well, curious also, this is very much that New Yorker cartoon about like, you know, the New Yorker's view of the world. Where it's it's Saul Steinberg, it's, yes. Yeah, Saul Steinberg, where it sort of ends at the edge. Um, but it, it's interesting to look at this work, which is very purely figurative in a, in a in way, but to compare it to your work from the early 90s, for example, where you were in Guyana, the, the yeah. beach scene, the tragedy, that, looks, that reminds me of like Frank Moore's work, where you're in this like dystopic, apocalyptic, quite photorealistic, graphic, but a little bit fantasy-like. Yeah, 
and Frank and I were really good friends and Dorothy, my wife, um, knew him and he uh, showed at Sproni Westwater also. And, you know, we had a dialogue. Um, I have a wonderful painting of his of a polar bear in a, a, a bathroom. Um, we have a wonderful painting of his. So there was a dialogue and I always thought that he did a fantastic job of, you know, internalizing his relationship to having AIDS. He eventually succumbed to it. Um, I can't remember, maybe 12 years ago. And mm -hmm. we, Miss him terribly, but uh, yeah, Frank Moore is very. Uh, um, I feel that I felt that in the earlier work, but now as we're moving, this this particular work, which is, I guess, four or five years later than your trip to Guyana, and yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, I start to feel there's a little bit more of a kind of like a a little bit more of a blurry, obfuscated, slightly impressionistic view of things, where where if you're imagining dystopia, like this isn't literal dystopia, it's imagined dystopia, that's an effective uh, visual strategy to convey that's it. Interesting. Yeah, you know, that actually is, is an interesting comment. I think what was happening, I was looking at a lot of um, film uh, concept art, and um, it's those guys who are fantastic, Sid Mead and Matthew Yurisich and um, uh, William Cameron Manzies, they use illustrational tech strategies to get ideas across. And I think that that's what I was um, relating to is sort of more poppy in terms of like pulp comic book stuff. Um, so that's, I think that's smart. Next image. I included this, Amy, because this is the painting that you put in that show at the Weatherspoon. I remember. So this isn't exactly climate change. This is just extinctions at the hands of humans since um, Columbus. So, um, but I just included this for that was in 1998. 1998. We go. We go way back. That's yeah, way back. Mm -hmm. um, this is now at the Department of Fisheries in Seattle, um, University of Washington. Next. Oh, okay. Good. I, I always remember that snake around the wheel, like the snake in the brown tree snake trying yeah. to get to Hawaii. Yeah. Um, Manifest Destiny was really my attempt to do something activist, which obviously here we are. I don't think it did that well, but I showed it originally at the um, the Brooklyn Museum. It went on the road for a couple of years and it's 24 feet long. And um, uh, it was a lot of fun and a challenge to do. And I got really sick of painting windows after um, and perspective after this. So I, I uh, liberated myself with more alchemy. And again, this, as you said, this is more of like that sci-fi illustration feel. Right. Next image. So here's the painting as of a couple of months ago in the Smithsonian having a wonderful, I mean, this is a dream come true and I'm lucky enough to have that once in a while, um, having a dialogue with uh, Thomas Moran's uh, um, uh, epic painting of Yosemite. And I literally was thinking of that painting when I made it, little did I know that it would end up in that collection. So this is a, per a but nothing's permanent. This is an installation right now at the Smithsonian if you wanna go there to check it out. Is that your baseball cap on the chair? Uh, no, I've actually never seen it. I think it's my assistant who photographed it, Alexander Winch, because that's exactly what he would be wearing. That's very observant. Uh, uh, Next image. It looks a little bit like the Mies Barcelona setup is responsible. <laughs> it's the mediator between Moran and Alexis Rockman. So exactly. The Santa Rosa by Barcelona chairs. Yeah, go Quite ahead. by modernism. Um, this is a sort of outgrowth. I did a project called American Icons that tried to get more painterly stuff into smaller paintings. And this is one of my favorites um, with invasive uh, snakehead from Southeast Asia um, now all over the world. Look at those mangroves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's unlikely because mangroves are the first to go um, when humans are around, but uh, it, it, it made sense at the time. The flying cockroach. Okay, this is like super high surrealism for me because if you talk about distant, like if surrealism is the practice of combining distant corners of reality and making you see but each of the corners completely differently, this is that, right? Like a, a, a tropical mangrove in, you know, South Dakota, Badlands, where we know where Mount Rushmore is. It feels quite, you know, I can't think of more two more dissonant physical environments. So. Exactly. That's that's a good point. Um, and then you could have um, uh, Cary Grant climbing around on the uh, oh. yeah. <laughs> next image. Um, using the ideas of pictorial film noir and James Wong Howe, the great cinematographer. And little did I know that, you know, uh, middle Florida would be closer to this than I could ever imagine, um, you know, uh, 20 years later or 15 years later. So um, again, and those are 
besides the, the, the painting, it's the ideas of using the uh, language of reproduction. And then you have a European wild boar and a nutria um, you know, mating, which probably wouldn't work out so well, but um, there's, there's attempts at, at intimacy in some way or another. Who would think of such things? Only that's amazing. Yeah. I love the melting Epcot Center though. That's really, it looks like a piece of ice just going down, melting. Yeah, and I love Buckminster Fuller, um, but that idea of it like utopian technology, it is our only hope and it has got us into this position too. Next image. And this is my response to finishing Manifest Destiny where I made a body of work um, called Weather Drawings that was just like really using the language of the history of painting and polka and kefir and all this stuff and, um, and Corbet and just trying to, you know, go through images that took maybe a couple of days to make, um, even though they're quite large. Almost like watercolor, even though they're oil. I mean, that that is so art historically referential. This painting yeah. is, I mean, in 50 ways, it's really, really something beautiful. Thank you. Wait, it's oil on gessoed paper. Okay, yeah. so is the paper mounted to board. How do you keep the surfaces? You gesso the hell out of it and then you staple it down on a big board. Okay. Um, after it dries, it takes a couple of days to a couple of days to dry, and then you you know you can you frame it like uh, any drawing. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. Next image. Um, this is my foray into more. I did a project called Half Life. I just wanted to have this because. This is a good segue. Dorothy and I went to Antarctica, which was really my introduction to the polar regions. Um, and I made this painting when I got back. Um, uh, and it's obviously a joke about art history and Morris Lewis and turning one of his iconic images into a piece of landscape. Right, it's, that's, that's a Morris Lewis veil if there was one with a little splash mark in front and some penguins on top. I'm sure he'd be appalled, but you know, that's the- That's for sure. Because name. also, you know, Wayne Tebow did something similar with Morris Lewis during those cliffs, mm -hmm. the California cliffs, it's the same thing. Oh, that's really interesting. I, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Next yeah. image. And this is a part of a project that I did with Dana Fries Hansen out of Grand Rapids about the history and future of the Great Lakes. Um, this is one of five paintings and this is basically resources um, that, are, that have been exploited by humans since the Pleistocene, that ice on the left, which is a remnant of a glacier. Next image. And this was actually commissioned for a Lindblad expedition boat, National Geographic. Um, it's on some state-of-the-art boat that um, uh, I don't know where it is in the world. Um, and Dorothy and I got a trip to the Galapagos as part of the payment for that. So that was really fun. Wow, I'll say that's beautiful. What, so is the, that little circuit, what is that little uh, colorful circular sphere in the center? That is the base of the food chain. So it's like an inverted triangle, ah. right? So on the left, you have the Arctic and on the right, you have the Antarctic. Right, but look at that poor painting too. You have a little nice Frankenthalery. Exactly. Poor kind of effect, nice. Thank God they did that body of work to have a relationship to it. All right, exactly. Obviously, Victor Hugo was doing incredible things with, you know, coffee grounds 100 years earlier. Mm -hmm. Next image. Um, I'm just going to give you a little tour of our trip to Antarctica because that was a perfect gateway into the glacier project that um, two of the paintings are at uh, James's space right now. Uh, next image. So that's us getting on. We had two trips under the uh, Limblad National Geographic and this is the first one in 2007 when we went to Antarctica. Next image, that's Dorothy. There's our, um, our, our itinerary and it took about 12 days. Next image. Wow. That's crossing the Drake Passage where you start to see fragments of glaciers that have broken off. And that's what icebergs, all icebergs were glaciers at one point. Wow. Yeah, and then uh, next image. Um, <laughs> that was one of the first things we saw was a sinking ship. And Dorothy, who was writing for the Times, the New York Times at the time, became the correspondent on the bridge. And it was very interesting to watch the crew and um, passengers treat Dorothy very differently after they realized that she was part of the uh, media, that the Red Seas parted wherever she went. And <laughs> very friendly. Um, but um, everyone was rescued. Next image. Yeah. Those are the people being rescued. 
and luckily it wasn't rough at all. The Drake Passage is the most notoriously rough part of the the uh, the world in terms of ocean travel. And um, I I promise you, going there was nauseating. Coming back was okay. But when you're looking down at this trench and you can't see the horizon and all you see are like what feels like 40 foot waves, I'm sure it wasn't. Um, and then you look up and you see um, an albatross having a great time on the crest of the wave, um, 20 feet above you. You're like, holy mackerel, I hope I get out of here alive. <laughs> the, yeah, the tough, and, the tough uh, sailor. I mean, I'm looking at these people in these small boats wondering where they're going to get to. Like, it, it, it probably was quite scary, quite... They were, yeah, they were on the open ocean for about 18 hours. Next image, please. And then this is just ice. And one of the things about photography is that you can never capture how amazing these things look because they have their own light and photography doesn't really capture it. Um, and part of the point of making paintings is doing things that photography and other languages can't do, hopefully. Next image. Um, next image, that's Dorothy and I in a calm moment. <laughs> next image. Have you ever put then, the view in one of the paintings, Alexis? Uh, uh, no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, I try to examine the history of uh, uh, anthropology and archeology span in the paintings. That inflatable kayaks is not what, what I wanna be painting right now. Mm -hmm. um, but that photograph turned into this watercolor um, mm -hmm. and I did a show initially using our experience there and um, I showed it at Mass Mocha um, in 2008, I believe. Next image. And here's some of the watercolors. There's a lot of playfulness and, you know, obviously there, I didn't see any two-headed penguins, but I started to think about the point of view of the upper left, like, oh, what was the jellyfish thinking when the ship was sinking? Next image. And here I am looking 15 years ago, a little younger and less gray, um, working on this project that ended up being 36 feet long. Next image. So those are on seven pieces of paper that are 75 inches tall. And they're basically just portraits. It's a portrait of ice that I, I assume um, didn't have long to, to be on the face of the earth because um, it was melting. So in a way it's like endangered uh, ge geology. Next image. Where is that today? That is in a private collection, the Pappas family collection in Boston, I believe. And here's a detail, so you can just sort of see the, you know, action of the paint and, you know, a lot of palette knife and throwing stuff and dripping and pouring manganese blue and stuff like that. I always saw palette knives were so macho, like, <laughs> but still like such a macho medium. Dana Schutz uses a palette knife all the time. <laughs> Say it again. Dana Schutz does, right. <laughs> Dana Schutz does, but I, I, Forrest bested, I guess he wasn't terribly, you know, macho that way, but I love palette knife. I love the work of palette knives, so. Me, me too, and it's a way because you can't control, you can't even see what you're doing half the time, and that's what's right. so fun about it. Next, so do, next you see a, do you see a monkey or an ape in this uh, iceberg? Um, you're, did you take any drugs? <laughs> I was gonna ask you, I, I was gonna ask you, have you had any either- That's you, not me. What? Spiritual or drug experiences that have allowed you to participate so much in the inner life of animals and mammals. I, um, well, I actually, I'm really attracted to things that are a little less lovable, like, you know, reptiles and amphibians and insects. But I, I mean, I've never taken hallucinatory drugs except for mushrooms once in 1989. And I have no relationship to organized theology, but I do find going into natural places transcendental and it's a type of religion and I, you know, I, I, I cherish those like diving or snorkeling or going to a rainforest of the dead. All those things to me are profoundly transformative. And um, I, I, I absolutely love that. Even though Dorothy might be laughing if she's watching this because she also knows that I love sitting in my air conditioned studio in the dark. <laughs> <About Alexis, eight. laughs> when you get these underwater images, do you take underwater photos or is that all from your memory? It's neither. I do use a lot of reference and, you know, looking around at the history of illustration, photography. I love, you know, people like David Dubolet, who is a fantastic underwater photographer. It's really me picking and choosing from, I mean, the internet, of course, I had books my whole life. 
and my uncle was an uh, early photographer of Jacques Cousteau, you know, all these things completely influenced me. And I'm like a conduit from that stuff, National Geographic, into what I think is actually happening to the world. And um, sometimes it's a little painful. Next image. Field drawings. I'm just gonna go through this really quickly. Um, next image. I got this idea with Mark, Diane, when we were in Guyana, when I didn't, I ran out of a pencil, the, the one pencil I had, and he was joking around and said, you should use that mosquito that bit you as a drawing material. And I started to think about it. And I realized he was actually onto something because of Richard Long and those guys. So I'm going to give you a quick tour of some of the places that I've done these, which are made out of organic material with a, a little acrylic polymer, just to make sure it doesn't fall off the, the, the paper. The first couple I did cracked like any mud would on paper and ended up falling off. So I, I realized that Elmer's glue or acrylic matte medium is, is the way to go. Next image. Dorothy and I went to Tasmania and did a bunch of work about um, uh, the ecology there. Next image. So anything from, you know, weedy sea gra dragon made out of um, kelp to wombat made out of wombat poop, um, literally. Um, <laughs> That was fun to smuggle back to the States. Um, I made drawings out of sperm whale, spermaceti, my own blood from for a leech, so on. Next image. Um, this is a project I did for the parish, um, I guess about uh, six years ago. That's my, our, our now deceased dog. Um, uh, Lucy Winton called me and said, you have to go check out this incredible leatherback turtle, just like my painting from Guyana on the beach. And um, when we came across it, it was covered in seabirds that were eating its face, and it was incredibly beautiful. Next image. Collecting stuff there, make, working on the field drawings. Next image. Those are some of the places. Next image. And there's the installation at the parish. Those are um, Jean Castelli's family, uh, Lisa Silver and their two sons. Next image. Some more images from that project. Next image, Natural History of New York City at Salon 94. Next image, that happens to be our backyard in the uh, in Manhattan. So those are the roaches, the ailanthus, the mouse, and the, the irritating squirrel. Next image. Don't you have an, Don't you have a little background in urban archaeology, Alexis? Don't you come by that very honestly? Could you, you know, call my mom's by? an urban archaeologist who. Um, I vowed to have nothing to do with what she was doing professionally when I was a kid. And the older I get, the more there's convergence. What is that? <laughs> I don't know. That's so funny. Absolutely. And this is the install. Next image. Site Santa Fe asked me to do a project there, which is a real, really fun and interesting. I, I was lucky enough to work with an unemployed um, uh, entomologist who now has a job, thank God. Next image, who drove me around. To those places, this is a frame grab from the catalog. Next image. Go figure, I ended up making all the work in France, in Provence, the summer of 2017. And um, this is the FedEx box of the stuff when it showed up um, through customs. Next image. And here is a couple of pages of some of the work. Next image. And that's the installation at Site Santa Fe. Next image. All right, glaciers. We're gonna uh, race through this. Next image. <laughs> I just wanna say that I started this project with glaciers in 2005 before we went to Antarctica. And then Antarctica really jump-started my fascination with this. And then I went back to this body of work as paintings a couple of years ago um, after David Lieber at uh, uh, Zerona Gallery asked me if I'd be interested in revisiting that body of work. Next image. Next image. Next image. So this is before the trip to Antarctica. Next image. Ah, more recent. You know, yes. Alexis, we were discussing just briefly, I think it's interesting to illuminate. We were talking about both you and I completely coming from different perspectives is Georgia O'Keeffe's commission by the Dole Pineapple Company to go to Hawaii and to make paintings of the 
heliconias and um, grasses and palms and fruits that were there on the Dole Plantation and how that was such an inspiration to both you and I. Yes, um, absolutely. It, you, yeah. I was shocked at how you, you saw that instantly. The, um, we were looking particularly at a, at a, not at a glacier, but there was a glacier painting in the room. We were just talking about that process of being like a truth teller, you know, someone on expedition, someone invited from the outside, someone who has a facility for visual language and decides to paint what they see. I mean, I, that body of work is a very under, um, underappreciated slightly or under, I mean, I think it's appreciated, but it, it isn't really revered. It's, you know, all works that are commissions feel a little bit marginal to what an artist does on their own. Right. Yeah. And so that, that, that Dole series from O'Keefe never gets its due per se. But well, I, I learned about it when it was shown at the New York Botanical Gardens several years ago, and it was really a revelation. And one of the things that struck me about it is that so many of the things that she was painting were introduced species. They're not endemic to that area. So when I was thinking about being inspired by it, I think they're fantastic paintings and like amazing, but I started to think about what were the things that were displaced by that pineapple plantation? Or well, curiously, the Dole Corporation, as I understand it, didn't like it very much and didn't use many of the things that she did not, you know, it didn't go as they had planned, let me say. Uh, Wasn't total reverence for the Dole Pineapple Corporation. And she's definitely onto something. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, next image. Next image. So these are all, you know, um, uh, Greenlandish. I don't even know what the correct term is. Um, whatever that language is, these are different terms for what glaciers do. It's a fascinating experience to go into these dictionaries and try to find like, you know, glacier that falls not too far from itself as it, you know, calves into the ocean um, with, um, you can't really see in, in these, uh, um, these reproductions, but there's very detailed, very specific kayaks and um, different boats from uh, native people from um, the Arctic that I'm fascinated by as, as anthropology. Next image. Next image. Next image. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the painting behind us. And I know that I'm looking at the time and I know we only have a couple more minutes. So Amy, you saw this painting yesterday. So I'm fascinated to hear, next image. Now this is a phone shot. So <laughs> it's very right. blurry. And blurry. So yeah. this is a work that you were commissioned to do for the Mystic Seaport in Mystic, Connecticut. Correct? Yes, Mr. Mystic Seaport Museum. Right, and this is, as I under, I remember when you were just getting started and there were blank panels you were staring at, yep. uh, this was all done during the pandemic. Like you were just completely, you know, in your dark air conditioned studio with lots of visual source materials, but trying to imagine what the right, um, what the right sort of manifestation of, of, of what you wanted to depict could be. So there's the boats on the surface are in many, are many famous boats, uh, Darwin's Beagle, right on through to um, Amistad, all the way through. And these are all, many of them are models that are in the Mystic Seaport Museum, is that right? Yes, absolutely. And I constructed it through the lens of their collection. And I thought, well, you know, many people know about, the, the, that constituency knows the boats, but I'm fascinated by what the boats did to the world. And that's really what the painting's about. It's almost from a fish's point of view of like, oh shit, I see that boat coming, I'm in trouble. Um, I better get out of here type of thing. Well, I, when, you're see, when you see this painting live and not from an iPhone photograph, what I think is so magnificent about it is you really allowed yourself to get lost in the paint here. You really were in these sort of dark, swirly, blue, black vortexes and halos of light and, and paint. And, um, you know, you let yourself be a real painter here, seriously. And then it, sometimes I feel like the subject matter is so compelling and, and um, present and palpable and visible that that comes first. And then the painterly part is sort of layered in. But yeah. in this case, I felt like you started a painting. That is the challenge. 
It's a lifelong battle. <laughs> Let's show a couple of details if you can go forward. Um, there you can see the scale of it. That's a little clearer. Um, next image. And again, the lower right, you can see it's like stretching and moving and stuff. And Amy's completely right. And, and Dorothy, my wife, again, be a painter first, make that stuff active and the other stuff will follow and have the enchantment of the materials, hopefully. Next image. A lot of palette knife again, Amy. Ah, <laughs> love it. Next image. I just saw like an early soulage a few hours ago. It reminds me a little of that too. Although I think you're, you know, you sort of do more with it for me, but keep going. I appreciate that. Thank you. Next image. Next image. Next image. And then there's going to be 10 watercolors that go with that project. And I have four to make over the next couple of weeks. Um, and these are again, uh, 52 by 75 inches. Uh, next image. Alexis, can you explain just for a second the construction of this painting? Because it's quite a large painting that comes apart into panels. Can you explain that a bit? Sure. It's painted on dye bond and it has an aluminum substrate, which is just a support cradle on the back. And it's in six panels and you break it apart like a book and, you know, put them in the, the I've been doing, I maybe made seven or eight paintings this size before. And, um, you know, you hope that the seams don't get uh, violated or else you have to touch them up, but it's generally a pretty effective uh, uh, strategy. Um, and again, I paint on panels because um, if you do it on canvas and you're doing a lot of wet material like paint, it always just goes to the center of gravity, no matter how rigid the stretching job is. So I learned the hard way that um, you better have a, a, having a flat surface makes the activity of the paint more democratic. Um, and then the, the next, this is the, um, the hibiscus flower that, um, that that's in James's show and is a direct relationship to um, uh, uh, what Amy and I were talking about. This is a, a, a flower that was believed to have been extinct until it was discovered by a drone last year and in a very um, uh, uh, um, uh, remote uh, cliff configuration and then some very endangered honey creepers that are endemic to Hawaii as well and that butterfly. So um, I felt like that they can see it right behind me. Yeah, that was a very good answer. Not that I dislike in any way George O'Keefe's paintings, but I was thinking about this as the alternative to that, not agricultural items, but these are things that are hanging on by a thread. Next image. Couple of installation shots. Next image. Some um, field drawings from Natural History of New York. Um, next image. Next image. Next image. Next image. And then this painting from 1990. Don't jump ahead too much. Mm -hmm. Go back on you. The Amaryllis. Yeah. So, and that's nice to see because there was a lot of palette knife in it too, but it's not as fluid as some of the things I've been doing recently. Um, but it miraculously is exactly the same size as those two glacier paintings. I have a real OCD, like 48 by 40, 32 by 40. It always has to be the same size. I know what the material is going to do. That's well, since you hadn't seen this painting for some decades, what was it like for you to see it again? Um, mixed, I was like, hey, maybe I was better then. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard but to know. You have to give up stuff to get stuff. You were probably like, ah, youth, you know, there it is yeah. in that painting. My I remember what I, I went to play basketball right after finishing that, uh, uh, that amaryllis flower. I wanted to ask you, do you get a, um, ideas for your paintings when you're playing basketball? No, I, I don't. I, um, but that's running, yes, which I hate doing. But basketball, <laughs> no, I'm too engaged with what I'm doing to really think about anything else. I would imagine you play basketball to forget. <laughs> yes, exactly. Forget all the tough information I've been dealing with all day. But then the joy of painting. So that's the duality. So that's the last image, I believe. Well, I've always appreciated how you're able to tackle some of the most difficult and apocalyptic subjects of our time, but at the same time have a kind of beauty and elegance and also just an air of hopefulness. Like there's something about showing or rendering what's happening that gives that gives meaning and that gives life to it, that gives urgency to it, that gives value to it. And part of coupling these very sometimes difficult ideas with, with your painterly capacities makes the work 
you know, present and valuable and important to consider and look at. Thank you so much. And it's an honor to have a conversation with you about it. It'll survive the ages. I believe that in your work. So thank Alexis, you. it's been a pretty rough summer for the climate. I'm curious, do you feel any hope or do you feel hopeless? Um, there's been some progress. It's, it's, you know, one would have, I mean, the title of the, um, the, the show is A Molecule from Madness, which is a play on a book about Alzheimer's that is called A Molecule Away from Madness. And when Dorothy and I heard a discussion with the author on NPR, I thought, oh, you know, the molecule of foss you know, fossil fuels, CO2, whatever, um, we are to, to wake up every morning and to think about this, it, to not go mad is a struggle. Um, so anyway, I thought it was a, a nice open-ended provocative um, lyrical title that can be interpreted in many ways. You know, the interesting thing is, although you're dealing with these difficult topics, it's a lyrical show. You come in, you can get absolutely lost just looking at the cold wax on these glacier paintings. You could spend an hour just looking at these. So um, I commend you because I actually think hopelessness is paralyzing. Oh, absolutely. You, you've moved us forward. You continue to move us forward. I see you uh, not only as a great painter, but also something of a warrior in terms of um, leading us to understand what the peril is and also to keep us aware and hopefully move forward from it. Yep, we're all still getting out of bed every morning. So that's something helpful. <laughs> Amy, any last questions you've got for Alexis? Um, I, you know, thank you for in including me in this. I've, I've, I mean, I first worked with Alexis in the 90s, like the mid to late 90s, I guess late 90s. So we, we go way, way back and certainly followed your work for a long time. And I, every time I see it, I remember what I've seen. It's incredibly prescient and um, pointed and no one paints like you. So thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. And maybe you can do a rain dance so it rains in Litchfield County for us. <laughs> we, all need, we all need rain here, you know. I'd like to say if I, if I ever have uh, laryngitis or something, I'm going to invite the two of you on a Zoom. I've probably never been so silent in my entire life without having 104 fever. <laughs> and that's going to say, oh my God, I've never seen you say nothing for 40 minutes. So thank you both for being here. It was really a pleasure. And uh, Amy, Alexis, you both are amazing. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Take care. Bye-bye.